Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You look like a fine audience, and you don't have to laugh, and you don't have to clap. I'm just going to talk to you as if we're in our living room, and we're talking among friends, because uh, I'm not a uh, typical guest speaker. I don't go around speaking for money, but Brandon has been after me for so long, and my brother, who comes here all the time, he comes mostly in the evening, he's been after me for years, and uh, I'm a published author. I write, is what I do. I write stories, articles, to perpetuate the history that we old men made in World War II. And uh, I've been successful at it, and uh, they, pay, they, they send me money. I don't need the money, so what I do is I donate it to different libraries especially the Air Force Academy, donate a lot of money to the library fund, and also to the Starkle uh, Institute at Carlisle uh, Barracks. Uh, I've been donating to them for okay, over 20 years. Stronger, we'll and so, uh, because of Brandon, such a Brandon nice kid, he came out to the house, he interviewed me and so forth, and the wife says, I think you should go. I said, oh, all right, then I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> so any event, uh, this is my, the latest story. I, like, I write a lot of stories and I have published. This was published in, an, uh, in, a, in a, a British magazine, Barnes & Noble carries it. If you go in, you can take a look. But this was in last September, and it's called Fly Pass. Very, very good uh, uh, aviation, uh, World War II aviation, uh, and it's, it's got such a great uh, um, circulation that that's where I wanted the story to go, and it was about a, a, a crew that, f that flew in my outfit. That doesn't do it. You have to take it down. And they had not, not enough fuel to get back. So the pilot says, call Dumbo, that's the Navy Catalina, they'll pick us up, and, I, and I'll, I'll you, must, you must fly the aircraft under power so the men can get out. So the men all bailed out, he thought they had bailed out, he went into the bomb bay, and there stood his flight engineer. He says, I told you to bail out. He said, yes, sir, I'm right behind you. <laughs> so he bailed out, and he didn't know, but he found out later, they all got picked up by a submarine, incidentally, that this Guillermo Abrego, an American Mexican out of Oklahoma, he was scared to death of drowning, couldn't swim. So he knew the aircraft intimately, and he was going to fly that airplane back to Tinian, that's the island that they took off with the atomic bomb. Well, they told us, and he, the two enlisted men on the flight deck was the radio operator, which I was, radio radar, and the flight engineer, and they told us, if you have to fly the aircraft, pilot and co-pilot are incapacitated, then never try to land the aircraft wheels down, you'll die. You land it wheels up and you'll live because it'll screw, it'll screw it on the ground and eventually stop. But this guy thought he was a pilot. And he, at 11 o'clock at night, he, he had lost 2,000 pounds. Uh -oh, he had so leaned down the fuel. And he actually flew it back to 11 o'clock at night. Permission to land. Then they give him permission to land. And he tries to land wheels down. That was his death knoll. He, that you don't do. And, and so when he hit the ground, he bounced. That's the first thing you do because you, you don't know how. You're not coming at the right, angle, the right speed. So he tried to go around, and it was out of gas. And all the engines shut down. And when the plane landed and cracked open, the crew, the, the ground crew went in, the Navy went in looking for him. He said, this is a ghost ship. They couldn't find the body to flown out. Well, he lived six hours and died, never come out of the coma. So this is of the story. There are some here, not enough for people, but that the, uh, we'll leave one they'll make copies if that was the one of them and you'll get a copy, okay? And there's a few other, uh, here's a thing oh, that I want to, I just don't write stories. I help anybody who's trying to find father, relative, cousin, uh, 12 or 13 years ago, it was an advertisement in the Air Force magazine called the, uh, the Aero Historian. Uh, it was a group called Walkers out of Scotland, England. They worked for Rolls-Royce. 
And they would go out and they knew where wrecks were and they'd find wrecks, took a spitfire out of a lake and they, 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 they rebuilt it. And over the years they, they've got become a, a museum and now subsidized by the government. So what, what they did is they found a B-29 that went down 49 that uh, everybody was killed. Nine bodies were identifiable, the other 11 were not. So they, the, the nine were buried in their own home states, the family, and the other 11 were buried in St. Louis in one grave in the middle of the country so the relatives could get to the, easily to the, uh, to the cemetery. So anyway, a group of us got together around the country and the lieutenant colonel found them through a, through a motor vehicle. He found uh, the daughter and, uh, and then we eventually paid and sent the two daughters over. They were, they were just little girls and the father died. And we sent them over and they put up the bronze plaques and so forth. And 12 years later, I get a letter from Ron Ward, a Scotch fellow I kept in contact with, and he says, the wreckage is spread all over the mountain, three blocks, three miles down the mountain. So the, 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 the small village, the people go out, it's a place to go, they picnic, they go out, they look at the wreckage. And the youngster's out there with a neighbor, 11 years old, he sees something glittering in the ground, and he finds a man's wedding band with the initials FMD. So he looked on the plaque, and sure enough, this one of the men was killed. The bodies were so mutilated they couldn't identify them. So probably a hand was cut off, a finger was cut off, and they just laid, and the body disintegrated, and the ring laid since 49. So they asked me if I could find, well, my connections with doing research and so forth, I was able to uh, find out where the man, all I wanted to know, I called my friend at Maxwell Air Force Base, just tell me where he was born, where he came from. So they come back to Arkansas, pick up the telephone. I said, give me any Dobbs in a small town. So they gave me a half a dozen. First one I called, I said, oh, he says, that's my husband's brother. I, I said, is he alive? I said, no, uh, he called his younger brother. He, so I called him and he said, yes, the man had two daughters. His wife remarried, she's dead. Uh, the son died and the daughter lived in California and gave me the daughter's name and so forth. I called her and the girl did not know her father. She was uh, two or three, four months old when he died. Never saw him. So the result was that uh, I put them together and she went over this past spring, well, just recently, and uh, I suggested she give some sort of gift to the youngster, since she would, and so she went up. I'm sure she got the ring. I haven't heard anything yet back about it. So these are the type of things that I still do. I had just recently got a letter from a man in in Italy, of all places, and I guess I'm becoming famous because he found the dog tag. He says in the water by, and it was a B-24 wreck under, uh, they were skin diving, and, it, and a man's name on it, and his, his, from his, uh, his serial number, it, it said that 33, that means he's from this area, but he was drafted. So I, I wrote to him, and I says, I want to see a picture you know, make a picture or drawing, show me exactly what's there. Because if it's Army, Army would have your father or next to kid's name and address to be notified. If it was Navy, I don't know whether they had an extra kin on there or not. So I'm waiting for an answer and then I'll, I'll try to help them. So anyway, these are here and they can make the copies. And I like to uh, pitch a book. This friend of mine, Lou Zamperini is, is famous because he was on the 36 Olympic crew. He was a track star at the University of Southern California. And he... Uh, There's something happening to your mic. You're cutting out. And uh, we don't know what it is, but uh, let's see if we can't uh, move it around to a different spot. Maybe you're not getting sound down to that spot. Well, Lou Zamperini went to the, to the 1930 Olympics um, and he was fortunate enough to meet Hitler too while he was there because what he did, he climbed up a flagpole 
and he stole the Nazi flag and came down and got caught. And they said, why are you stealing the flag? He says, I want to take the flag home to show my family and friends that I've been in Germany, that I've been, and they thought it was so wonderful, they told him to keep the flag. And Hitler, when he came, he asked to meet him, and they brought him to Hitler, and he shook his hand. So anyway, he was a bombardier in another squadron, and he flew with a Green Hornet, the, and they were hunting for a, a general that went down, and all things they went down. And only three of them got out alive on a raft, 47 days. The only one, they were rescued by the Japs. So that meant imprisonment. So he was a prisoner for two and a half years. He took some awful beatings because he was so famous. But when his friend said to him, they keep asking for you to make propaganda speeches, he said, don't turn them down. Do it. At least your family will know you're alive. Been there nine, ten months. So he did. Immediately then the, 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 uh, the government picks up on the radio and they notified his family was alive. So once he was that famous, then it started to lay off. But he got some, he wrote a book that's absolutely fabulous. It came out uh, recently. Barnes & Noble has the book. Um, it's about $24 and change. If you get the 10% off, if you have a card, you save 10%. But it's a great book. And in any event, I'm going to talk to the library to put a couple of copies in. Maybe you can borrow it. it it's great, great. Still alive, 86 years old, still running, flying his own plane. Okay, folks, let's get into my story. <laughs> All right. Uh, World War II, I was a radio operator, radar operator, gunner, and also cameraman. They didn't carry a cameraman, so they made the radio operator was taught to use a camera. <clears throat> and so that's what I did. I flew 56 combat missions in a B-24. Now, not all those missions were considered combat where you bombed the target. And my flying record just says T for training, C for combat. Whenever you went out on a flying mission, hunting for subs, that was combat. Well. When I got out of the service, the man typing up my records, he wrote, counted up so all the C's, 56 combat missions. He gave me credit for actual combat missions. I only flew 20 by the government's count. So in any event, uh, that's what I flew at since on my discharge. <clears throat> now let's get started to my story. I was born and raised in Philadelphia. I was 19 years old. My friend Bobby Kirsten, childhood friend, he said, George, let's go down and enlist. We enlist, we get what we want. Otherwise, we're going to the infantry. You don't want to go in the infantry. No, I said, I want to go in the Air Corps. I, I want to fly. So I talked to my mother. I said, Bobby's going. I said, sign. So she finally consented, my dad, and they signed. And we went down into to the armory at or Lancaster Avenue, I think 39th Street. Went in, went through. I was first finished. I walked in. I handed the sergeant a paper. He said, sign this young man. I signed it. And in comes Bobby. I don't look too happy. I said, what's the matter, Bobby? He said, I flunked the physical. I said, what do you mean you flunked the physical? I got a hernia. I said, oh, my friend ain't going, I ain't going. He says, uh, <laughs> son, he says, you signed that paper, the minute you signed it, you were in the United States Army. He may not be gone, but you're in. So anyway, the draft board in, in uh, the cookie way the draft boards worked, they draft him, honey and all. So the Army operates on Bobby, fixes up the hernia, and they gave him a marvelous job. He went around ret retrieving with a crew the bodies. When a man was killed and they buried him, he went looking for graves registration. And that's what he did the whole war in Europe, hunted for, bo for bo bodies. So anyway, my mother got so upset, she went down there and she really gave it to Bob. And the result was that there's nothing Bobby could do. We apologized. Well, I went into the service. 
I went to radio school. From radio school, uh, I was sent by train to California. The B-17 outfits with 11th Bomb Group were originally at Hickam Field where the Japs struck. It was the only bomb group in action from, from December 7th to the end of the war on August 15th. The 17s were going out. They had come back. They were regrouping with 24s, and so they needed all new men, all new job descriptions. So that's where I was going. So I was on the train, and we're in Pullman, and we're going through it. And uh, the sergeant comes around, and he's got to be in bed by 10 o'clock. And he said, you two down here, you up there, you two down there, you up there. And I said to the other guy, look, I ain't sleeping with another guy. I said, if he ain't my brother, I ain't sleeping with him. So he said, <laughs> he says, I don't care, I'm going to sleep. So I went up front. If you've ever been on an old, there's old trains up front, was where the toilets were and a bunch of sinks. I sat there reading a book. In comes this redneck sergeant. He says, boy, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading. What are you reading? He says, you've got to be in bed. You, you, you go hit the sack. I said, I know, I, and I'm, not, I'm not sleeping with another guy. I said, what are you, some kind of smart ass? Said, no, you're a wise guy, he said. I said, no, Sergeant, the book says, I read the regulations, no two men will occupy the same bunk at the same time. If they do so, it's a court-martial offense. And I'm... He says, you are wise guy, just come with me. Well, we do four or five cars down. We go into a group where we have the compartments, knocks on the door, come, walk in. The man's sitting there, sitting on a bunk with his shirt off. But I see right away there's a major, shirt's hanging up, major leave. I come to attention right away. Sir, he says, I got a smart ass here. He says, you won't go to sleep. He said, I ain't sleep with another guy. So he gave a little smile and he says, what's your story, soldier? I said, well, sir, I says, he give me an order that will get me court-martialed. I said, if I sleep with that man, I'm subject to be court-martialed because the regulations clearly state no two men will occupy the same bunk at the same time. And he turned and he says, to, he says, see, sir, he's a wise guy, you see. He says, Sergeant, he's absolutely right. Well, it blew, it blew the air right out of this poor guy. But sir, this is an emergency. Sergeant, it says nothing about emergencies in the book of regulations. So and then as he got to leave, he said, oh, Sergeant, bring back two breakfasts instead of one tomorrow morning. And I'll tell you, that blew him away, that poor guy. Are you hearing me all right, or are you not picking it up on it? Too much level. In any event, now let's get all of my life in the military. I was wounded and I was returned to Valley Forge Hospital. And uh, I was partially paralyzed on one side. One man in the aircraft, a 20 millimeter hit the top of, the, of his gun. I had been giving ammunition to them. I had taken pictures and closed it down. And when it hit, it exploded, blew into Oscar's head and he went down immediately. I got peppered down one side, the navigator behind me got peppered in the back. I pulled him out of the way and I held him and I knew he was dying. And what do you do when you're 19 years old? It, it, you know, the only thing I remember my mother saying, you say a prayer to help the dead get into heaven. And the only thing I really knew was the 23rd Psalm and that's what I said. And my navigator, poor guy, when he turned around and he seen, he seen that, he said, son of a bitch. And when I met him 40 years later at a reunion, we were on the Columbia River. He says, George, some, sit down. Now, we worked together closely because our two deaths were only inches apart. And he said, uh, what are you doing? And so forth and so on. And I see that this man is skinny as a rail and looks like an alcoholic. And he was brilliant. I said, uh, I'm going to mention Oscar's name and see what happens. So I mentioned Oscar's name. And with that, he jumped up and uttered the same words he did on that airplane. It was Christmas Eve, 1943. 
son of a bitch and ran away. And he went right to the barn and had two shots. And, and then I, I knew that he was suffering post-traumatic stress. Then they called it combat fatigue. But I had psychiatric treatment at Valley Forge Hospital and I kind of got saved, but he didn't. And I just try to tell you these things, some good, some bad, some funny. Uh, from there on, they asked me to go on a war, lo a war loan drive, which I did. In fact, two of the, we went to Schubert Theater and Warner Brothers were there and they taught us how to talk and so forth, an audience. And I met two members of the Memphis Bell, the radio operator and the tail gunner were, were with me. They said, where's the Seventh Air Force? Never heard of it. It's out in the Pacific. It must be a little Air Force. I said, yeah, it's little, like the Eighth. <laughs> and uh, they, they shut them up. They, but anyway, so when I got over, I asked to be assigned to a crew. And right away, they, they were regrouping. They needed a radio operator. Pilot came down and interviewed me. I guess he liked what he saw. He says, OK, you've got a job. And he hired me. <clears throat> The first raid I went out on was was Nauru. Uh, where's Brandon? All right, Brandon, if you want to show, you can show the, the Nauru raid. We're starting now on number four, OK? Um, we bombed the island of Nauru. Famous picture was taken by my, 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 one of my gunners was taking pictures with a hand camera, uh, 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 military. And uh, the picture that he took became famous. It went all around the world. He even got a commendation from General Hap Arnold. And uh, it's in a, uh, Brandon gave me a gift of a book. A picture of it is in the book. I think he'd probably show you a picture. Oh, there it is. This plane was to our left. And uh, Dan, Dan took a picture. This is Nauru Island, a very large island. It's 40 miles across very large and um, it looks like the atomic bomb but it's not there was a cloud and there's there's smoke below it the dark is coming up and it hit the cloud and it looks like a mushroom so this picture was in time magazine and life magazine it went all around the world when i say 40 miles i'm sorry it's four miles in diameter down in the room and, and it was taken by Staff Sergeant Dan Marquette of Toledo, Ohio. He's passed on. And Dan was a professional ball player. He played, uh, when he came back, he played for the, for the Kansas, uh, Kansas City team. And that famous Yankee manager, he wasn't that famous. He was his manager. Anybody remember his name? The Casey famous Stengel. talk funny? Casey Stengel. Huh? Casey Stengel. Casey Stengel was his manager. He says to Dan, he says, kiddo, he says, you got beer legs. You ain't never going to make it in baseball. Go home and get a good job and retire. And that's what Dan did. Went to work for Libby Owens. OK, the next picture is the Kansas Cyclone B-24 over Truck Island. OK, this picture, uh, Wallingford was my pilot. My board was the, was the accredited uh, cameraman from the outfit. Uh, and it was taken on a mission over truck. And this picture is, uh, is on a book written. There's a man by the name of Birdsall, Steve Birdsall. I would imagine they have a copy of a lot book of the library. Steve Birdsall, an Australian, he read an article that I wrote for Greek magazine when I was in the hospital over there. And he called me from California when he was visiting and researching here. And he used much of my story and the pictures is used. There's a full page donated to that raid in, in our last, my last mission uh, over, uh, well, uh, actually, this is my plane, but the mission was over Maloa Lap in the Marshall Group. Okay, we move on. Oh, okay, we got to get a little humor. We, we can't just give you uh, blood and guts. The story of the red-headed corporal. Now, this is true to life. It's a funny story. Uh, I'll tell it as delicately as I can. <laughs> the story of the red-headed corporal. 
We were on the island of Funafuti. That was the island that the Japs, we, we bombed our route. The Japs followed us back because a pilot, it was new, he just come from the States. He gets on, he was young, he gets on the radio and he says, where should I go back to? Should I go back to so-and-so or back to Funafuti? So he tell the Japs where we're going. <laughs> so they followed us back that night. We were debriefed. We always were debriefed. And they treat us breakfast. And then we'd go to sleep. And as soon as we got in the stack, the alarm went off, and they bombed us for 12 solid hours, wave after wave. It's in Life magazine. <laughs> Have pictures of the bombing. Oh, okay. This is in Life magazine. This was Nauru Island, taken by us. And these, this is the briefing. That was our General Hale, 7th Air Force. And we had a lot of men killed and wounded. And the radio operator was wounded. And I was a replacement for that radio operator. And uh, we lost, oh, maybe a dozen or so planes there. Some were repaired. And this man that wrote this book, uh, Lou Zamperini, he flew over in a plane called Superman. And he said Superman was absolutely devastated at Funafuti. But he didn't know after he went down and was captured that they sent a crew down. They took parts of the different planes and put Superman back together and it flew again. Okay, we're moving on. Oh, oh, oh I got to tell you about the, the corporal. On the island of Funafuti, the natives were very lovely. They were nice people. For cigarettes, you could go and they'd go up and get your coconuts. Uh, they would make things for you. I had a, a lovely uh, um, boat one of them made with the outriggers on them, you know. It wasn't a souvenir. It was really 24 inches long, made by, gave them two packs of cigarettes. It's on display now. I donated it to Pennsylvania. It's, I guess it's the archaeological, some of uh, the museum at the University of Pennsylvania. They have it. <clears throat> so on the island, while we were there, there was, they had a red-headed corporal, Marines, big, tall, skinny kid. And a native girl on the island gives birth to a red-headed baby. <laughs> now there are no red-headed natives. Well, this was such a novelty to these people that the chief went to see the major who commanded the Marines. And the major thought he's coming to really complain. He's really got a problem. He came and asked if he could have the redheaded corporal to feature his women. They all wanted redheaded <laughs> So the corporal said no. And uh, later on, I don't remember we were there or not or whether, but later on they gave him a medal. They had a mock, the Marines used to do that mock, and they gave him a medal. He became famous. Anyway, let's go on. It's not all laughter. Okay, George K. with Harry Hutchison, Trenton, New Jersey. A dear friend who was later missing in action from Trenton, New Jersey, went to radio school with me. There we were in front. We were, we were teamed up with the... Uh, we were quartered with the Marines in their Quonset hut, 6th Marine Defense Battalion. We were quartered with the Marines, and uh, we were told that watch your equipment, the Marines will steal anything that's not nailed down. And so uh, I went, walked in and I said, uh, I was a staff sergeant, I said, I was a staff sergeant, so and so and so, and, and this is my weapon, serial number, number so and so and so, I'm gonna hang it up right there on, on the edge of the, of the, of the cot and it better be there in the morning. I says, anything else I have, if you ask politely, I can, I'll give it to you. And I, I got along great with them. And, and, and one day I'm sitting there writing a letter. We were there for three weeks, and, and, and Mousy was, the, was their sergeant, and he's drinking this homemade booze, and I never drank, I didn't even drink beer, and uh, he says, Sergeant, you want to taste? He says, it's good stuff. So I would be a man, I said, okay, I'll, take a taste. Well, I took a taste, and that stuff almost knocked me over. It was just pure alcohol. I says, Mousy, how do you drink this crap? He says, Sarge, well, you don't have anything else, you drink it. Well, I was a kid with guts, raised in the city of Philadelphia, 
streetwise, knowledgeable. I said, uh, you got an officer's club on this island? He said, uh, yeah, it's a white building down the road on the left. So, so we had a chief assigned to us. I, I wore a weapon. I had wings. I just made staff sergeant. I had a new shirt. And so I, I can't sew. I didn't sew any stripes on. And, and I used this trick before. I drove down, parked the Jeep, walked in. I says, I'm with the Army Air Corps here. I said, we came down so fast I didn't bring a booze. Can I buy a bottle of booze? Yes, sir, you can buy two bottles. He says, what do you want? I said, what do you got? He says, Shenley back label and old Methuselah. I says, I'll take one of each. So bulk 80, I gave him $3 and change. Come back and I set him down. And old Mousey looked up and he squinted, a little bitty guy. Walked over and he looked at it, and I, he used a, a awful word. Where did this come from? I said, I went down and boss come and bought it. How you say? I said, No, I went out and bought it. How'd you do that? I told him the uniform. He looked at me. He said, Sarge, we got to have that uniform. <laughs> and so I left my complete uniform except the shoes. I left the uniform there with the wings, which is sewed on. And I, I, he said to me, they gave me a medal. I have it mounted on a plaque now that they gave me, and I have it in my den. He says, you're smart enough to be a Marine. <laughs> so that was quite a compliment. OK, where are we at now? <coughs> well, at the Canton Island Airline Hotel. Canton Island, we worked out of Canton Island. Canton Island is in the group where Amelia Hart was, was headed she was headed for Howland Island. Howland and Canton and another island are all part of the Phoenix group. And uh, Canton, at, uh, before the war, was used by Pan American Airways. They had a hotel there. It was a wooden building with a lot of room, but nothing fancy. And they spent the night, and they got their fuel, and they had their crew there. And uh, that's where we worked out of when we started the uh, what they call Galvanic Campaign, which is Gilbert's and Marshall. That's when we started taking island. We called us the island hoppers. We took islands and hopped from island to island. Then I showed them the two trees on Canton. On Canton, it's nothing but coral and sand. Nothing grows but a few odd weeds. So some commander flew it in when it was smaller and planted a palm tree. And that palm tree has grown. It's split up, and it's grown. And they even got a top where the men would look out. They had men up there, like, looking out with five glasses. And this is the type of buildings that they had on. It's all they had. They were the type we lived in while we were there. The only thing good about being in the Pacific, when you came back, always got a steak dinner. Or even in Europe, they got a steak dinner. The food was great. And then we had the lagoons. We could sleep, go to the beach, swim, fish. You know, no snow. It was lovely. <laughs> All right. All right, let's go next. The briefing for the night raid on Tarawa. This is the shacks we lived in. We lived there with our ground crew. Doris, 10 men, and our ground crew was about six men. This was my operations officer, a fine man, loved by everybody. I started out with him when he was the first lieutenant, and uh, uh, later on, he, he made, uh, he was a major, he made lieutenant colonel, went home on leave, came back for another tour, and got killed on the next tour. It was sad, he was a, he was just a handsome, wonderful guy. The men loved him. It, it was one of those men that, that he wasn't hard, he wasn't soft, but he could get anything done that he wanted. And we had a fine, fine outfit because of this man. The crew of the Kansas Cyclone. Okay. Wally Ford is up top. A tall man is our pilot, the navigator. That's the man I said, said son of a bitch. Uh, uh, Woodruff. Uh, he, so he retired from the service as lieutenant colonel. This is my bombardier, and he, and he was from Texas, Center, Texas. And I said to him, his name was Augie. 
Uh, you know, uh, not doggy, doggy. Like they say, get along, little doggy. Well, that's a little baby runt calf. And he stood five feet four. I said, you sure you're a Texan? I said, I heard they were all six foot. And he would laugh, you know. He, we got along great. He was just great. My, our ground crew, the, the crew, assistant crew, Jack Lohman, Pennsylvania, he was up in, up in Pennsylvania. I stayed in touch with him. He died in 54. I stayed, he was up in his 80s till he died, come to reunions. When, I, when they finished up the missions, I wasn't there because I was wounded and came back to the States. Wally Ford and the men chipped in and they gave a solid gold watch to him and Lou. Because our plane flew, we never worried, we never had to start go back for maintenance. Our plane was always in tip-top condition. This is Oscar. He, this is the man that, that died. I was 20 then, he was 21. If you look at the face, you'll see his name is Oscar Richard Smothers. The Smothers brother's father and his father were brothers. And if you look, he's got the same face that the Smothers. And, he's, and, they're, and, and they're, they're, the family name is Richard, Oscar Richard. Oscar's the family name. And so Richard Smothers and he are named from the same grandfather. I, I visited his grave, he's buried in Florence. I visited, uh, I visited uh, his family. Now we crashed at sea. We went down and we hit the water. We got picked up by PBY and they didn't want to take the body aboard. They left the body in the water. I said, he don't go, I don't go, Oscar goes. And so I said, we're only a short distance from Canton. I said, from there they'll send him to Hawaii and he'll be buried and the family can get him. And that's what they did. Now the only one left living today is me, this charming boyish looking fella here, <laughs> uh, Augie. Polish fella from Boston, Lou Heitzman, a real loner. He lives 20 miles from me in Tom's River. I keep sending him stuff and different things about the outfit. I've never seen him since the end of the war. He's an absolute loner. When he flew with us, when we got off, he went one way, we went another. He never talked, never bothered. He's just a total loner. And uh, Bernie Cray, there's only four of us still alive. Wallingford. Uh, was a concert pianist, and he uh, he was he had a doctorate in music, and he headed the music department at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and he passed away in December January 24th of this year. Well, let's see where we are now. Pilot and crew chief of the Kansas Cyclone. Give you a look at the. This was uh, the Kansas Cyclone. This was, was our nose art, and we, we gave the honor to Wally Ford to pick out the nose art, and he said the scariest thing he can remember as a child was a, a cyclone. Nothing scarier to him than a cyclone. So between him and the man who painted it, they come up with the outhouse, the cyclone hitting it, <laughs> and the Jap running out, pulling up his pants. And, so the article, the one article that I wrote for Brief Magazine, it's been, been picked up and used in many, many other books and articles. It's, it's, in, it's in one of the books that Brandon gave me, one as a gift, it's in there. So it, it made the Kansas Cyclone famous because of that article. And uh, as skinny as he was, the man was a hell of a pilot. And you know that many, many musicians were great pilots in World War II. Skitch Henderson, anybody remember him? Oh, yeah. Uh, B-29s. Uh, Ernie, Ernie Ford, the Tennessee singer, he flew B-29s. There's a, many of them, but they somehow musicians were great pilots. We stayed in touch <coughs> for all these years. Uh, he went to Juilliard School of Music. I went up, met his wife. I spent the weekend in their apartment in New York, and uh, I stayed in touch with his children. We returned gifts. The wife and I have visited, visited him, and these are friendships that you build up that, that die with you die. I believe the crew that crashed on Baker Island. This is a crew we always flew alongside. Uh, oh, here's a story of interest. 
Bill Rubel was our original bombardier, the <laughs> nicest, sweetest, loveliest man. But he liked to sit at a bar. He was a delightful drunk. He sat at a bar. He would drink, never bother anybody, fall asleep. He just liked to sit and talk and, and, and get drunk. And uh, he had a car, an old Packard convertible. He used to pay the ground crew, get him gasoline, mix it with kerosene, and put gas in it. And I said, Bill, you better stop driving that thing. You're going to kill yourself. I said, it's so high octane. He shut the motor off, and it would run for half an hour before it shut off. <laughs> this is true. So Wallingford didn't, Wallingford didn't like him. He, was, he didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He was a, a clean, religious man. And he pressured and got rid of him. So we traded him, and we got Augie, or Doggy. And Doggy was a worse drunk than he was. <laughs> so that's it. And we flew alongside of this man, John Lee. I stayed in touch with John, and we'd go to reunions. And this lovely man here was our commanding officer. He looked younger than me when I was 20. This man was 25 or 26 years old, blonde hair, still alive. Retired colonel, he was our commanding officer. Good man. And when I got sent back to the States, I had my, uh, I had my air medal. I had, three, I had three air medals. I had the, I had the uh, Purple Heart and the other medals I got. But my DFC, we had a drunken awards uh, medal clerk, who uh, awards the medal clerk, and he gave the medal, he gave the medal to Heitzman, one of the replacements, the guy that didn't talk to anybody. And so for years I tried to get him, but all our records of my Air Force people know they burn up in a fire in 72. The same as a employee set them on fire and burn up all the Air Force records. So it's very difficult without documentation to be able to get your medals. So they told me if I get the issue in authority, and that was, that was uh, Colonel Anderson, and I, I, I called them and I told them who I was. And I, and I says, I was on Wallingford's crew and the young fella got killed. And he came right back. He said, that was the kid who was killed with 20 millimeter. I said, yes, sir. And I said, uh, I want to get my DFC. And they said, I, you were the issuing authority that I could get it. Well, anyway, with his help, 42 years later, I got my distinguished flying cross. So I, I went down to Bowling Air Force Base the 11th wing is now, now it's a reactivated 11th bomb group, but it's called the 11th wing at Bowling Air Force Base. And this man, uh, Colonel Roger, he became a general. He presented me with my DFC after all those years. And it was such an experience that I was floating. The wife looked at me after we were driving home and she said, George, you were oblivious, you were floating. She said, it just was a wonderful experience. And this man, he supports the Pentagon. He commanded Bowling Air Force Base, and, and, and whatever the Pentagon needed, they took care. He had, he had the guards at Arlington, he had the band, he had all that. So he had a three-piece or four-piece orchestra that were playing, and they were singing World War II songs. The uh, girl dressed up as a wax singing songs to me and then afterwards we had a hot and cold buffet it was fabulous and uh, we went back and and there was a man up there got a medal the same as I did he was stationed in McGuire and he finally found out he was a chaplain and I told him I'd like to meet him because I know everybody at McGuire maybe I knew him so we go up and meet him and we talked and I, I didn't know him and he said to me what religion are you I says, I'm Jewish. And my lovely wife, who is Catholic, she says, but I'm one of your flock, Father. And boy, if I had a camera, I'd have taken it. They hugged each other and laughed. He was like 40 years old. It was quite a scene. It was one of the most marvelous times for me, getting the medal, you know. But uh, it's just something to remember. And I got two daughters. At that time, I would have said, Daddy, I want your medals. I want to hang them, frame them, hang them in John's room. My children never asked me what you did in the war, what, nothing. If I had a son, I guess they would, but I, we're, we're five, we were four brothers and we all had girls. So 
any event, let's move on. Uh, and now Lee, Lee's crew, that one before the crash. Now P-40s are being f forwarded, uh, for flown. They stopped at Baker Island, and we used Baker Island like, like it was a, an aircraft carrier. If we were in trouble coming back, we landed here, got fixed up, or we needed fuel, or it was a long mission, we landed, spent the night, and went, flew out of here. And today it's a bird sanctuary. And uh, the P-40s are lined up. They were, they, they were being uh, uh, flown into to, to, to Tarawa. And so Lieb, when Lyle Lieb got hurt, he got hit. In the back of the plane, we carried flares. And they flew them out of the waist window. And, and when it got hit, the flares were phosphorus. They hit and they started burning. The hydraulic fluid was floating all around. And they got a real mass of fire going on back there. And when we went to use the fire extinguishers, they couldn't use them because the ground crew used to use them to make their beer cold. <laughs> you, you, you do, you take fire extinguishers. You, have you ever given gas and it, you, it gets so cold? Well, that's what they find, and they were empty. So we carried on board 12 cases of dulled pineapple juice and we carried K rations. So if we landed somewhere, we were not to eat their food or drink their water unless we knew what it was and we would eat that, because we couldn't afford to get sick. So his crew uh, put the fire out with those pineapple juice. <laughs> and and their, 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 uh, their, their tail gunner, a young fellow I was still in touch, Don Watts, he lives in North Jersey, he, he, you, somebody had to unlock the door to let him out. He was in a turret. And uh, you can still see, he's, he's looking away. He's had, but that violent stuff on his face, his ears were bandaged up. He and the other guy, Merle, he just died, he was 91 years old. Merle, Merle said he had to get him out, they were friends, so he threw a blanket over and went right through the fire, uh, opened it up and drug him through the fire. So they, they each got medals, and uh, the, the uh, flight engineer, Lou Horton, that's Lou on the far end. Uh, he got the Silver Star and John Lee, lovely man, a little man, retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force, still talk to him, he was in Eden, California, Oklahoma, and uh, he got the DFC. And we stayed alight alongside of them, and they were going so slow, we were flying circles around them to keep up. Instead of getting ahead of them, we fly circles around them. And then he told us to land first because he was afraid he had a flat tire. So we landed first, got off the runway, and then he did, he did have a flat tire. And then when he did, the nose went down, the nose wheel caved in, and the turret in the front hit that metal and tore it up, and it just went bouncing right down the runway. But uh, they all got out alive, and uh, what they did, they took the engines off and anything that they could use and flew back to Canton. And I understand the wreckage is still on the island because we talked to the Department of the Interior takes care of that. It's now bird sanctuary. They take care of that island, Wake Island, a bunch of other little islands. And they, they sent us pictures that, of the, but the pictures were, were not very good. But the, the body of it's still laying there. Okay, where do we go from here? Uh, Uh, the showering point in Baker Island. We had the best conveniences. <laughs> this was our shower. You can see the man nude there taking a shower. And we, there were nothing but cans, and they filled them up with, uh, it, it was um, water that was brought in. Uh, There's no water, so that they filled them up. But we weren't allowed to take real showers. We took sponge baths, and it used up so much water. Primitive, but that's the way we live. It was home. Uh, I, uh, we, I did show you the medals award, awarded to the crew that crashed on Baker Island. The story of the galvanized goose. Uh, Wayne Cheney was a gunner on, the, on an aircraft that flew alongside of us uh, uh, on many a mission. We flew with the galvanized goose, another one called the Dirty Woman, 
And the pilot of that was a Walter Gunther who lives out. I still talk to Walter. We, I go out and visit him. We go to air shows, went to reunions. He's 86. And uh, he lives out in Newtown, Newtown Square, Pennsylvania. I think that's it. Uh, these are friendships that you make with these people that's closer than brothers. You stay friends with them for life. So Cheney wrote this uh, story, and he sent it to me, and I put it together because I used to lecture at the Vernon County College, and I, I had the print shop where I could, and I put them to better, into books and donated one to every museum that I could, that I knew that would want it. And um, the galvanized goose uh, stayed alongside of us uh, in our last mission. In fact, the, the pilot was a peculiar man um, McGreevy he was very self-centered, went on to become a TWA airline pilot. Uh, he was going to leave us. And his co-pilot was, uh, uh, was a roommate and a friend of uh, Wally Ford, my pilot, and they went through primary flight school together. And he said, if you don't stay with him, I'll have you brought up on charges for being a coward. And he looked at him, and he meant it. And so he also started that circle around us. But he stayed with us until we, well, well we went down. We, we, we hit the water, and we got the, 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 the PBY, and the, they picked us up and brought us into Baker. Then from Baker, we went to Canton. From Canton, I went back to a hospital in uh, Honolulu. OK, we're moving right along. Recon photographs of Moab Island and the Marshalls. These are actual combat pictures were given to me after the war. A friend of mine who had been in radio school with me, I was, when I was 19, then he was like 31. And Wolf Howell was his name. And he was a smart, smart man. How did he get smart? He was line of typesetter for the Book of the Month Club. And so he had to read everything as he typed. And so he read every book and he, he just was brilliant. He knew everything. And, uh, he, and when they found out he was such a great typist, Captain Hatcher, our intelligence man, he said, I want you for the intelligence. He says, I need a great typist. There's a lot of typing in the briefings and all. So these were some of the pictures taken by low-flying B-25s and fighters. This is the island I got hit over. These, are the, these were the, the type of units, the barracks that the Japs lived in off the ground. And uh, we hit this island so bad, later you'll see pictures of it. Here it is. We bombed this island. There wasn't a place, there wasn't a place where the bomb didn't fall. It got to the point, it was a tough target. When we flew, later it became a milk run. You could go, they, the men went there for the first and last missions. Okay. The Tarfu map and the Pacific area. I, Harry Girdler, who's a very good friend of mine, was a navigator. He went to work for Pan American Airways, retired from Pan, work, Pan Am. He was, their, he was their station rep, like in Lebanon, Morocco, Turkey, Greece, that area. And so he got this continental map. And he asked Continental, told him what he was going to do. They sent him two. And he, cut, he, he covered the blue up with their lines of what they flew. And then he put in, this is every island that we, we either stayed at or every island that we bombed. Uh, from Honolulu to Johnson. Like from Wake Island, we would go to Midway. And we bombed uh, Wake uh, three times. And then uh, Wochi was the island we were going to hit, but it, the, 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 it, the clouds moved over. And, and so if you didn't hit the target, you didn't get credit. So then we went on down to uh, Maloalap. We hit Malo Maloalap was down below here. And uh, Harry put this together. And uh, he made them up, and he sold them to the men. Everyone, I think it cost them something like $2 to print up, and uh, he, he charged them $2, and every man got a copy. And see, there's a picture of his crew, our missions with the Tarfu. This is in Hollywood, California. Stay in touch. 
our wives and all, we went, we had the reunions together. When our wives went, we went and we shared rooms together. Okay, Pratt, Bella, Texas. This is the first time a parachute was used to stop an aircraft. Uh, Pratt was in trouble. He was headed back for, for Nuka Fatal, which was part of the Ellis group. Nuka Fatal and Bruno um, Fudi were in the same group, Ellis Islands. And that was never taken over by the Japs. It was the, the, the British had it. And uh, his hydraulics out, no brakes. So what he did was, he got the idea, he had the men tie parachutes to the rear and to both waist guns. And it literally worked, it really, it literally stopped them. And uh, it, up there, uh, the, the, the Bell of Texas, the name of the, Arnold and Hale, he got a, a commendation, which was a medal, the whole crew which got a commendation from, from Hap Arnold for it. And then the, the Air Force started to use it. Today it's used in all heavy aircraft and fighters and so forth. But uh, poor Pratt, when your number's up, it's up. Later on, Pratt was dropping, uh, it was either truck or Grom, they were dro dropping uh, mines in their, in their harbor. And uh, I don't know whether he got shot down. I was gone when that happened. Or somebody dropped a mine and another mine hit him and it crashed and he was right off the island. They picked him up and his crew were all prisoners except one man. When he was dropping mines, he would leave one man go and stay back home. He didn't need them all. And that man got credit for a mission. So every other mission, he'd take a different man. So that one man was the only survivor. They were captured. The Japs killed them, and he and the officers, they ate. Oh. It's been documented, it's true, uh, there it is. After the war, this is documentation, I've seen this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a encyclopedia of Pacific Area War when the two, and it's known the number of down Allied flyers that natives were eaten by the Japanese station on the island. The Japanese Army Command issued special instructions on preparation of human flesh consumption, even specifying the parts to be allocated to the officers' mess. So it was proven, and after the war, the Admiral and two of the officers, high-ranking naval officers, were brought back to, to Kwajalein Island. They were court-martialed and hung. That's the worst thing you can do to a Jap is hang him. I mean, you can let him commit Harry Carey or cut his head off. But to hang them, it's the, it's the worst thing. It's like putting pork in the mouth of a Muslim. It, it means he can't go to heaven. But these are the things that happen. So, you know, it, uh, it's, it's real life, and uh, they, they live by a different uh, um, uh, culture, and it was much different than ours. Bombardier in the B-24 nose turret. This is one of our, our, our bombardiers, and it was taken in there, and so uh, I had somebody have a camera there and took a picture so we could see, and, and you today can see what, our, what these turrets were, a very high-class piece of tech uh, that, that would stay, and uh, it was great. But more aircraft were shot down by the fixed guns, the waist guns and the tail guns that were shot down with these. You had to be really great to be able to use these things. These had uh, special sights, electronic, I guess they were. And I'm the only man that got, I shot down two. I got one credit, and then I, when I left, I don't know whether I ever, I never got credit or I, I was gone, and I don't know whatever happened to the second one. But I was the only one on the crew to shot down an aircraft. One air was painted on the side. But anyway, it's, give you an idea of how it was. The radio position on the B-24, uh, that's me taking uh, my bombardier, a nice fellow that liked to drink, uh, Bill Rubel. He had a little camera. He smiled, George, and I smiled, and I would just swirl my, my, I'd just swirl my seat around, 
I have my earphones on, I had a throat mic, I got my May West on, my leather jacket, and we were headed for a target. I think it was Wake Island. And he took that picture. It's the only picture I have that's inside the aircraft. Oh, and this is my position. This is the radio, the transmitter is down here. This is the receiver. Uh, off to the side here, I don't think it shows all, but off to the side was the tuning for the frequencies. And up here was a gadget. It's up in that corner, see that little box? That was called IFF, identify friend or foe. That was there, if we came in an area, uh, uh, they all had them, and uh, that would be beeping a certain signal. We had four settings for different times of the day. They were supposed to not shoot at us. We come out after bombing Tarao one day, and we come out of a bank of clouds. We come over, and I never saw so many ships. They were getting ready to invade the, ta the Tarawa, and the Navy starts shooting at us, and I mean shooting. And, uh, and, uh, I, I told him, well, we better get out of here. They're going to they're gonna shoot us down. They're crazy. And he said, uh, you got the IFO? I said, yes, sir. It's on. Check it. Double check it. I checked it. I said, it's on right, sir. I said, the Navy shoots at everything. We had to go 250 miles around to get away from them. Uh, uh, <coughs> otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. But uh, this is the position. <laughs> Oh, I, I got the George K. You saw at DFC 95 after 42 years. You, you've already seen that. The Kansas Cyclone crew before and after. Uh, there we are. Now, you know, as we go through life, a lot of things happen. You look at Walling Ford now. He's five foot eight and a half inches tall. He was six feet two. He stood as tall as I am. He came down with osteoporosis, and one day he, he, was, he would, used to go out with his wife and he'd, and he'd, go, and he'd be a judge for, for concerts, for piano concerts and so forth, and he was putting his baggage into his trunk and he fell down, his back broke. You, you know, the lack of calcium, the back actually broke and, uh, and so to save him, they shortened him and so he was but by the time he died, which was in January, I saw pictures that were sent to me. He looked like a hunchback. He just kept shrinking. His legs were still as tall, but the body just kept shrinking and it was an utter pain at the end. See the field glasses? Those are the ones we use for sub-search, and he brought them back with him as a souvenir. Okay, now... We're getting near the end. Uh, what I do, I write, I lecture, is to perpetuate the history that we old men from World War II that flew in our primitive aircraft, high tech at the time, but when you look at aircraft today, they were primitive. We made the history that enabled the United States Air Force to become a separate service. And uh, this is what we're most proud of. The, 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 the second generation made it the finest Air Force in the world. And like I say, we hope that the third generation will make it even better. And we wish them good luck and good fortune in all their future endeavors. And now that's my speech. Uh, I'm open for questions. If there's any questions you would like to know or answer, I'll try to answer the best of my ability. And also, uh, if you want copies of these, uh, when uh, Brandon will see that you get them. You want me and to I'm pushing my friend's book. It's an interesting read. It, 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 it's a great story, and it, it's a tough story. The Japs, how cruel they were to the, to the Americans. Okay. Thank you. Any, anyone has a question? Let's uh, 
Use the mic so that the rest of us hear it. Is this the man whose son? Yeah. Mass unit? Yeah. Well, before Site 10, before they landed, they expect a lot of wounded. I was in the hospital. I was in the hospital in Honolulu, and they moved me. All ambulatory cases got moved to a mass hospital that was practicing up in the, above Waikiki. And, in, and that hospital was exactly like you see. Uh, what was the name of that story? Uh, with radar and all, it just, just, just yeah. like exactly, exactly the same. The doctors my, and nurses were the same. My unit was exactly the same. We even had radar in the unit. Radar. Right. This isn't exactly a question, but it's. I just wanted to mention that when when George referred to his friend who had the hernia, and he wanted to get into the army, it reminded me of the case of a fella just the complete opposite. He didn't want to get into the army. So he went to one of his friends and says, I know you have a hernia. Could I borrow your truss just for the physical examination? <laughs> Anyhow, the doctor examined him and says, OK, you're in. He says, what do you mean I'm in? I'm wearing a truss. He said, well, anybody who can wear a truss upside down goes to Arabia. <laughs> he says, I I'm, sending you, I'm sending you to Arabia so you can ride a camel. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you another story if you want to hear it. This is a human interest story. I wrote an article, had it published. I, I never knew, found out who the man was. I wrote to the Prince of Wales, tried to find out who the man was. Not the Prince of Wales, the Prince Philip. And I've never been able to find out who the man was. When I arrived at, the, at, at Valley Forge Military Hospital, uh, I, I was kept in a bed for a week, and then they made me an ambulatory. And every day when I walked out, there was a man sitting in a, in a, in a room in the doorway in a wheelchair, and we was always saying, you're passing out, you say hi, you wave, hello, how, how you doing? And this went on and on for over a week, and this man never answered me, never recognition. So I went to the nurse, they said, what's wrong with that guy sits in the doorway? I said, I say good morning to him every morning on the way to the to the latrine, I says, he don't, don't answer. She says, well, we don't know who he is. He's got amnesia and he can't talk. He, he got hit on the head. You see, he's got a dent in the head. He can't talk and he has no memory. So I says, all he do is sit there? He says, yeah. I says, how long has he been here? She says, nine, ten months. I said, well, can he leave? Can he go out? She says, absolutely. But the men don't bother with him because he, he can't communicate with him. So I said, you all right to take him out? So one day, friend of mine uh, had the bed next to me. I, we were going down to get an uh, afternoon uh, snack bar to get a milkshake. And I said, they call, him, they call him Jim. The girls didn't want to call him John Doe because he was alive and John Doe was a dead man. So they called him Jim. So I said, what do you say we take Jim down with us? So I started to push him out. And he started, about, 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 about. we couldn't talk. They talked like a mute. And I said, that's okay, Jim, we're going to take you for a little walk. That's okay. And I patted him, pushed him out, and we got him out in the hallway, and then he started, look, this man ain't been out of that room for nine months, except that they took him down for an x-ray or something. So we took him down and walked him in, pushed him in the side so the wheelchair was in the way. And uh, I, I said to my friend, what kind of you want? He says, get me a strawberry milkshake. So he's okay. So I got three strawberry milkshakes, and I came back, and he was, and I give it to Jim, but because of his arm, he was partially paralyzed. He couldn't get the straw, so I held it up and I held it to his mouth. Once he got a taste of that sweetness, my God, he was going up, 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 and he drank it all down. And he made a motion he wanted another one. So we got him another one. And uh, so then we, we took him to the mess hall, the first time he had been to the Chow, and he went in, and they, one day they had fish and chips. Well, I was never a big one for fish, but we had the, and he, he started to laugh. The first time we seen him any animation, and he started to eat them. And so he said, uh, he, when he got done, he wanted more. When he got him more. And these little signs started showing up, and one day, we took him to a movie in the Red Cross Center. They were showing an, a yank of the RAF with Tyrone Power. And um, when that movie came on, there was a scene in there where the girl was entertaining the troops. And it was in a, they were in a pub-like. 
and it was Gracie Fields. I didn't know who she was, but she's a very famous British vaudevillian. Well, when he seen her, and she started, they were singing Roll Out the Barrel, with that good hand, he starts to banging like this and, and laughing. And we'd never seen him. And my friend Charlie Cleveland, we looked and he said, what the hell's wrong with this guy? I, I never seen him come to life. And then he looked at me and I looked and he says, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I says, yeah. I said, this guy's not an American. So the next morning we go down and I get the nurse. I said, where did Jim come from? We don't know. I said, no, what theater operations? Where was he picked up? Where did he, she's North Africa. I said, he's not an American. She said, go tell the major, go tell the major. Because they sent the fingerprints to the FBI, come back, no match. And that was it, couldn't find anything. So I went and I told the major, and I, he said, why do you think? And I said, this, this, and this reasons, and so forth. Well, they sent his fingerprints down, they went out, and then I came up to go to a, a convalescent Air Force hospital with a polling New York, upstate near Hyde Park, and I left, and uh, I called down one day, that, that I had told the sergeant down, the first sergeant, that if paperwork comes in for my medal, for my medal, Come in. See that they get sent up to me. And so I called and I got him. He says, Sarge, they came in, they sent him up to Mitchell Field. Mitchell Field will hand deliver them when they when their weekly truck goes up there, you'll get them. So I said, Can you transfer me down to the ward? I don't want to see if there's anybody there that I still know. So I got the dietitian on the phone and she said, uh, oh Sergeant, how are you? I said, Yeah, I said, uh, I said, uh, well who's there? So and so. I said, how about Jim? I said, uh, uh, oh, you know, you were right. She said, he turned out to be a British Lance Corporal, picked up in North Africa. He was working with the Americans because they had the experience and we just came over. Well, I think Operation Torch they were first involved in. And uh, I said, what was his name? Do you know? She said, I don't know. She said, but uh, uh, the nurse knows. You call me, I'll, I'll find out. She said, but his aunt came down from, from Cicero, Illinois, his mother's sister immigrated after World War I, and she lives in Cicero, Illinois, because the sister couldn't come, the mother, so the aunt came, to be, and she only wanted to meet me because they would have never, he'd have been wound up in a, a VA hospital or Coatesville or someplace, and she wanted to meet me, and, and the Army, therefore, they, they didn't bother calling me, I mean, <laughs> I was part of the, the, the the story, but no one ever let me know. So for all these 50 years, I've been trying to find who the man is. And I, I just get no information whatsoever. So I finally got an idea. USA Day, said, I read it every day, and it says, if you need any help in something that was a good story, write us. I wrote a story about it. It was published in the British Royal Legion magazine. That's our American Legion magazine. It's like the American Legion magazine. And I'm going to see if, if they'll publish the story. And if it gets published and people and see it in Chicago and Cicero, there's got to be relatives there still alive that'll know the story. And maybe I'll find out who he was. Now that's, that's my story. Any questions? No questions? Thank you. You've been a great audience. I'll applaud you. Very nice. Very nice. Oh. Did you uh, meet the guy who would have been a pilot, Glenn Stevens? What was that? Did you meet of Glenn Stevens? Uh, the only thing I know about him, he was shot down in B B-24 and had to float around in the Pacific for about a week. His name I was didn't Glenn, hear all. Glenn F. Stevens. Go ahead, meet him. You didn't meet him. I, oh. I don't think I remember. I do know this guy, I think his name was uh, a Friendly or Friend. Uh, we, we took pictures of an SOS uh, on, um, what the hell was that island? I think it was Guam. And he was a sailor. He was hiding there all the time. And he wrote an SOS and you could see a man waving. So the, military, uh, the Navy sent a fire and they, they took pictures of him, dropped him, and a submarine came up every night for day and then he got picked up and brought back to the States. Oh, my brother lives in Jenkintown. My daughter's 